Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another online event of the Java User Group Switzerland in collaboration with our Swiss friends from the Software Crafts Romondi Meetup Group. My name is Peti Koch, and I'm your host from the Java User Group Switzerland. My co host, Alex Guva, uh, probably has some issues. Uh, he will join us later, so we will start uh, without him. It's a great pleasure to welcome Johan Martinson tonight. Hello, Johan. Thank you very much. And hello to everyone. I'm very happy to be here for the first time. Uh, it's a great discovery uh, to meet this double user group. Um, and um, we're in for a, a presentation that I like giving and some discussion afterwards. Um, I'm very excited. Thank you, Johan. Before we start, I have prepared a couple of slides. I'll quickly go through them. Um, first of all, a big thank you to all our sponsors. First, the sponsors of the Java User Group Switzerland, the platinum sponsor Mimacon, then our five gold sponsors and our silver sponsors. And Softcraft Monday has also new sponsors as far as I uh, Socraft and Socra Agile. Thanks to them for their support to make this uh, or to support uh, us. Then for you as a user, you are now uh, on the Big Marker webinar platform. You have the possibility to chat with, with each other. For example, uh, right into the chat, where are you based from? Um, Johan is from Grenoble in France, for example. Yes. So, a little bit international tonight. And then uh, the next tab is the Q&A tab. Uh, you can post there your questions. We will uh, pick them up and uh, we will try to answer them during the talk if they fit uh, into the moment. Um, please uh, vote on the questions. So, the, the best questions pop bubble up to the top and we'll pick it up first. Then if you want to get in touch with our community, for example, if you have an idea for an, ev for an event uh, or would, would like to um, host uh, or give a talk yourself, uh, share your experience, feel free to contact us uh, on the Slack workspace of the Chuck CH community. Uh, you see here the URL slack.jock.ch. If you want to get in touch with the SCR community, there's the meetup page for it. We can have discussions, for example. Then we will record this event and later publish it on our YouTube channel. Um, you can subscribe to the channel and if you click the bell, you will get a push notification as soon as the video is online. Um, same for the YouTube channel of the Software Crafts Romandy group. And uh, we have some upcoming events um, for the Java user group. There's a newsletter, uh, there's a form where you can subscribe yourself and you will get an email if there is a new uh, event uh, uh, announced. For example, tomorrow there will be one about Java 17 on site in Lucerne. And on December the 14th, we will have Dragan Stepanovic speaking about flow uh, with uh, async pull requests. And there are also some upcoming events on the SCR meetup page. Um, after the talk and the Q&A session, uh, we will uh, finish this big marker session and you will be automatically redirected into our wonder.me room. You see the URL here, it, it's wonder.chuck.ch. So you don't have to do anything. You will just land on that page. If you uh, are interested, uh, feel free to join us. Um, you can have a chat with each other. Um, you can move around in, in that uh, virtual space, build small uh, local circles and chat with each other, like uh, a little bit like in a real event. 
So that's everything from my side, and then I'll hand over to Johan. Okay. Very well. So, um, yeah, shall we do it like that? No, that's not going to work. Here we go. So, bug free by design. Um, this is many ways uh, to um, to just change the design and leave a lot less space for bugs. And I'm almost not going to talk about any tests in this whole session. Um, right, so let's start. Bugs, one way of looking at it, the more or less usual way to look at it, is this. You know, bugs happen, shit happens. I mean, I try not to make bugs, but what can I do? Another way, more interesting way of looking at it is that it might come from the design. It might not be the user's fault if they burn their hands when they're manipulating hot water. It might not be the wind's fault that this bridge collapsed in, in the 1950s. In fact, what happened here was that the wind kept blowing just at the right speed uh, to stimulate the, the eigenfrequency of the bridge. And so it went into bigger and bigger sways until it just broke down. And since this happened, uh, big um, bridges have been fixed and new bridges don't, uh, don't uh, at all have this vulnerabil vulnerability. So they have actually designed away the possibility of that error. And another, there are many places in, in, in manufacturing design where we actually pay attention to this and design away errors. Uh, so one way is getting rid of them completely. Another thing is problems you cannot get rid of, but you can limit the impacts of. Um, so these are two cars from separate um, times. And if we look at what happens to them is we have this car, old car, where the driver is probably hurt. Uh, even You can even see the driver's seat has been displaced to the uh, further behind. And um, he's probably not in a very good state. Whereas the modern car in the same accident uh, has almost no problem. Of course, the car is broken, but the driver is completely unscathed. So this idea of, of here we have improved the system. We have improved the design so that we limit the, the, the impact of errors. So we, we do this all over the place. Uh, not so much in software. Um, one, one thing we could say is that in software, we don't have the kinds of budgets uh, that we have here. And in a way that would be true. I mean, we don't have millions of dollars uh, in, the, in the startup I'm working with right now. There are only less than 10 developers. We don't have millions of euros to, uh, to bug proof our design. However, another way of looking at it is that <clears throat> in code, um, making a new experiment, making redesigning, refactoring, and pushing to production to test if it works is has almost no cost, comparatively speaking. So we have a matter in which we can design uh, very, very cheaply. And if when you know that um, you actually get good at something by doing a lot of experiments and having fast and qualitative feedback. We developers, we don't spend years developing something and putting it into production. We actually today uh, deploy, we can at least deploy to production several times a day. So we can experiment a lot and we get a very good feedback on that. So in fact, we are even better placed than real designers to become good designers. So even if we don't have tens of millions of euros to 
remove bugs, perhaps we can train and do a lot of experiments and, and do a lot of progress. Let's see. So designing to remove errors is uh, something it's called pokayoke in the lean method and coming from Japan. It's the idea that we improve the system uh, by problems that actually happen. And what defines a good system is catching errors early. In the developer world, uh, an ideal system could look something like this. We catch a lot of errors in the IDE, type errors, stuff like that. It costs almost nothing. Uh, if we have unit tests that catch errors, that costs a bit more, but still close to nothing. Perhaps we catch some errors in the CI and not locally. Well, it's less good, but it's still very good. Uh, then there's code reviews, and then there's dev platforms and staging, and then eventually maybe production. And we want to build a system where we uh, move the detection of most amount of errors up the funnel. It's not about coming to zero, it's about improving the shape of this funnel. But where do we start? I mean, we have to choose where to start and where to put our energy. And one easy way of doing that is to simply to deal with the problems that we actually have. So whenever there is a bug, we can ask ourselves a few questions. Like, when was it introduced? Why? Uh, not necessarily by whom, that's not very important. Uh, but what made it likely to introduce that? What made, uh, what induced the error, uh, the, the developer in error? Because it's always like an assumption. We think we're doing the right thing, but we're doing the wrong thing. And it's quite often because it's possible or even because it's like suggesting that we should do something which is actually an error. Now, could we bring the detection further up in the funnel so that we improve our system? So the idea is that whenever there's a bug, uh, we, we retrospect. Like uh, if it's a really small thing, we can retrospect for five minutes. Uh, it's always worth it. If it's a big one, maybe we take an hour or two to really get to the root of things. Um, the, the important thing is not how much time we spend, but actually seizing every opportunity to actually uh, improve the system. So this is typically after anything. We brainstorm, we have a lot of ideas. What if we did TDD, would it help? Uh, what if we had some formatting linting tools? Uh, there's actually a lot of bugs that can hide in ill-formatted code. Um, Perhaps we need examples when we specify so that we don't uh, misunderstand the, the P product owner um, and so on. Perhaps there is duplication. There's so many ways that we can actually reduce the errors. Some of them are in the code. Some of them are completely outside the code. This presentation is going to focus on a lot of things that we actually do in the code because, I don't know, that's the thing that I find the most funny and it's perhaps most surprising. But one example that I had with a team um, when I, before preparing this um, presentation, when I was starting to experiment with these things was that we were um, a few teams uh, sharing a development platform. And um, we were um, a team where I was working, we were uh, taking over a project, uh, putting a lot of tests in place, making it uh, a lot more um, healthy. And um, eventually we, we pushed a, a bug and uh, we didn't notice it. It was another team that uh, lost a few hours uh, um, trying to understand what happens. And so they came to us and told, yeah, you have this problem, you know. And we felt a bit bad about that. So we re retrospected on that. And in that case, it turned out that we did have tests for that piece of code. Uh, however, uh, because it was in Node.js, uh, JavaScript, uh, plain JavaScript at the time, we were able to write a test um, 
mocking a method that did not exist in production because there is no types, right? So one of the ideas that came up was uh, let's see if TypeScript can help us, you know? And it was really very clear. And, and within a few weeks, almost the whole project was um, had type uh, through TypeScript. Whereas a lot of colleagues uh, wanted to introduce TypeScript, but uh, met a lot of resistance from the team. In fact, our team also had resistance. I had tried to introduce that before. But now that we actually did have a problem, a real problem, uh, then it came to solve that problem and it was so much easier to, uh, to introduce it. Now, now that cycles kind of back to wh why am I doing this kind of presentation anyway? Um, so let's take some time and present myself. I'm, I'm Johan, I'm, I'm a long time crafter. I really like uh, doing things well. And so I tend to be in this situation where I bring good practices to teams, um, like TDD, testing, refactoring, DDD, you know, I like that. So I, I kind of do that. But one of the problems that we encounter when we bring in new practices to teams is that uh, people are, I don't know, uh, pushing, pushing back, you know, change management is hard. So looking at why are the good practices that I like uh, important and where can they be useful? And one of the things is uh, in reducing the amount of bugs. So I kind of changed the way I'm, I'm, I'm pushing things. I'm, I'm thinking about, okay, let's, let's do more continuous delivery or let's, uh, let's see if we can reduce the bug rate that we do. And good practices will be pulled and we will pull the good practices in a timely manner and only the ones that actually bring some value. Right, so it's an easy way of, of doing things. It's not really, to me at least, about delivering code without any bugs. It's more about having a healthy system and developing in a healthy way. Now, if we come back to the code part, uh, let's go into the really funny part. Uh, there are a few things that uh, we want to do. Uh, we would like to, of course, if possible, to make errors impossible. If we can't do that, uh, maybe we can compensate for them, accept more diverse input uh, and, uh, and handle them anyway. That's fair enough. Uh, if we can't do that, uh, perhaps we can at least make them less likely, less induce the developer in error. And finally, uh, the fourth one is that uh, if all else fails, all else fails, let's document and let's pray that the developer will read the documentation before introducing the error. Uh, now, really, documentation can be good, but Really, we want to do the other things first. So making errors impossible. So what do we mean by that? Well, it's it's like this child's game, you know, you can't put the wrong thing in the wrong uh, hole. So um, that's what we want to try to achieve with the code to some extent, at least. Um, and there are a few ways of doing that. Um, so we'd like to remove uh, what I call unconstrained construction, building invalid objects. We'd like to remove temporal coupling to make it impossible to do it in the wrong order. Uh, we'd like to remove the primitive obsession, which is also a source of bugs. I'll explain that later. And finally, if we can't solve the problems and make them impossible, uh, then we can address places where we have coupling without cohesion. Uh, coupling without cohesion is, um, I'll, like, I'll show that through, through a demo. Um, so if you don't know these terms, you'll get a hang of it. But basically coupling is um, two parts of the code have to change in the same, if one part change, changes, the other has to change. 
And cohesion is where that becomes, uh, we, these things are very close together or, or linked so that it becomes easy to change them at the same time. All right, so let's go into uh, constrained construction. If we can build every piece of the code or at least a lot of the objects uh, so that they are not valid, that they are valid when they are built and they don't have a time where they are invalid or maybe uh, we forget to initialize this property. Um, you know, let's take an example. You go into a restaurant or we have a code for a restaurant. We have a constructor menu and we have a few setters, but it becomes unclear. Is it a valid menu to have just a starter and a main course? Or do we want to enforce a starter, main course, and dessert to get the menu discount? There is no real way of knowing, right? At least the API of the class doesn't tell us that. Uh, a better way of doing it is to introduce a constructor where every mandatory um, property is passed. That's better, but it's still not good, right? I don't know if you see why it's not why it's not good, um, but we could have the bad idea of passing the starter as the first argument. That would be quite natural, maybe even a likely bug, right? Um, how could we solve that with types? We could introduce a type for the main course, a type for the starter, and another type for the dessert. So that's a bit more work, not really that much anymore. Uh, and at least it's an option to consider. We can remove that kind of problem if we just type things. And if we want um, to allow uh, to just have a starter and a main course, uh, so there are two valid uh, options of a menu. Then we can introduce more constructors, one constructor for each uh, valid option. And if we don't have the absolute chance of working in a beautiful language such, a, such as Java, uh, then we can revert to other things like a static factory method where we enumerate the valid ways of, uh, of building a menu. Perhaps in this case, a private constructor. So we can do this basically in any language. Right, so that's a constraint construction. So then we only have valid objects throughout the code. And we'll see later that um, if, if we put validation also in the constructor, then we kind of have a, um, a contract of uh, what kind of validations are made on that object. And it becomes very easy for the rest of the code to avoid if statements uh, treating invalid cases. Another uh, interesting way of um, oh, case of, of um, uh, bug source is temporal coupling. Temporal coupling is where um, the developer has to concentrate so that he calls things in the right order. Uh, you cannot do one thing before the other. And when there's nothing to enforce that, we sometimes have a bug. So this is an example uh, that we still see today in a lot of libraries and, and uh, even more so in, in enterprise code, uh, which is completely unnecessary. If we forget to call the connect method, uh, then the put data is going to thro throw an exception. Um, so, and, and if this, if there is some part of this code, which is in a bit of a corner case, then we're sure to discover this bug, bug late and in production. Right, so why is this such a problem? Because it's so easy to do otherwise. We can completely remove the source of this error. We can fix the root cause of the bug, which is simply by introducing two classes. The first uh, class has the, uh, uh, returns the open connection and, and you cannot make a mistake here. 
So it's a little bit more design, but it's an option to consider. There are several cases, several um, variations of temporal coupling. So let's look at another version of temporal coupling. Here we have a uh, tic-tac-toe game. Um, you know, tic-tac-toe is this board. We have three by three um, places and you can put your X or your O if you're the O player uh, in that case. And the idea is that you should make a, a full line or a full column or a file diagonal in order to win. So there are nine cases on the board. Now, is there a problem here? Will this code throw an exception? Um, maybe. At least there's a bug because I uh, I made a mistake. I played it twice. You know, um, the old player played it twice. And there is no way that Tic Tac Toe can enforce this rule that we switch turns between players. And if we want to avoid this kind of bug, then we have to test this behavior, this rule, in every place in the code where we are actually using the tic tac toe, which is, let's say, it, we won't do that, right? Even if we write, write tests, we will, will not do it in every place. But there's another way of doing it. Uh, you probably guessed already. In this way, there is no error possible because it's the tic tac toe game that keeps track of whose turn it is. Well, we can do the error once. Uh, I mean, the tic-tac-toe game can be buggy, uh, but we'll do it once and we'll fix it all over the project in one go. E also, I mean, I'm not gonna talk about tests here, but it's much more attractive to test the tic-tac-toe game in the second case because then that my test in enforcing this business rule all over the place. So small design change can make a big difference. Now, I know a few people who don't like mutable objects and tic-tac-toe is a mutable object here. That's another source of bugs, of course. So there is a possibility to uh, do this with immutable objects also. Uh, just have to do the trick of having one tic-tac-toe X class and one tic-tac-toe uh, O class. Uh, and the X returns an O and the O returns an X and vice versa. Very well, so we can often solve temporal coupling simply by encapsulating things and actually enforce that with the type system. Let's look at another uh, source of error, which is Primitive obsession. Primitive obsession is the idea of uh, using too much uh, the primitives of the language, that is the ints, the longs, the strings, the arrays, and so on and so forth, maps, like date often also, uh, and missing the opportunity to encapsulate them in order to enforce uh, domain primitives. Um, so here we don't really see a problem and this seems okay, right? Uh, but how about this? Is this a problem? Well, it's hard to know. I mean, we really have to, we don't know. The, the board is three by three. So it could be okay if it's one based, but it's not okay if it's zero based, right? Uh, and we really have to look inside the code in order to know if it's a legal, uh, legal input. We could document, of course, could add some Java doc, but in my own point of view, that would be less good than solving it in the type system. So here, there is no error possible because there, we have introduced enums. And because we have, a, um, because we're using an enum for the row and one another one for the column, then we cannot uh, mistake uh, row for column and vice versa. So it's a little bit more code, uh, 
maybe at the input of the application uh, at the rest root we have to i mean at the input of the application we always have a string right uh, so we have to translate that string into uh, an int maybe and then a row uh, with some validation but as soon as we have that then all the rest of the code will uh, benefit from this higher qualification so we remove the source of error it is like if we programmed with some assertions like we when we have the method occupy x we want to put the assertion that the, it's the right player's turn uh, we want to assert that uh, we're playing uh, at a, a, um, a spot that exists in the board and we've been replaced them by compiler checks. So we moved the detection of errors uh, a lot further up. We've moved them from production or from the tests up to the IDE. But can we, how far can we go with this? Is it possible to go all the way? Or, uh, I mean, there are more validations that we'd have to do you know, there are only only nine places on the board, so we'd have to. Uh, we'd like to check that the, the cell is free, or there are at least three cells on the board. Well, let's see if we can do that. So, can we enforce the rule that there are only nine turns in a tic-tac-toe game? And the answer is yes, it's possible. So here's a screenshot of the compiler error. We see that the tenth move is invalid and it does not compile. How is this? How do we do this? Um, I don't know. I'm I'm doing these things. That, this is I don't know. Maybe this is too much, but I'm trying these things uh, just to see how far we can go. Where, where is where are things? Um, too much. Uh, we have to experiment. We can't experiment in our production code, right? Um, so I like to do this, and maybe maybe you'd like to solve this problem also. It's it's quite a lot of fun actually. Um, if you do, um, I'm going to give you the solution here. So just uh, um, shut your ears and uh, <clears throat> and uh, listen up again uh, soon. So the trick here is to, we have an interface uh, where the occupy method returns the next st state. The implementations of this interface is the first one returns an instance of the second state. So the new game returns an instance of the second state. The second returns a third state. And when we come to the ninth state, it returns an end state, and the end state does not implement itech-tic-toe. Uh, so it doesn't have a method occupy, and so it doesn't compile. So that's fun, but is it too much? Is it too much to do in production code? I mean, we'd have 10 classes to implement this, right? Um, yeah, I think it's too much. It's it's certainly too much if we had uh, a lot of them. It's certainly not a good idea if we have like a range of possibilities, so nine or sixteen or you know uh, several possibilities. Because uh, yeah, the type system is simply not strong enough uh, to deal with these constraints. We'd have to go into some magic programming language like uh, Idris, which can actually do this a lot better. Uh, but we do normal languages in, uh, in our everyday life. So this is too much. But is it too much if we have three states? Maybe not. At least when we've done it a few times, it, it appears like a good solution. Uh, two states, certainly. That was the case with the connector. So by pushing the training and pushing the, the these experiments a bit further, then we kind of realize where it's useful and we can implement that very quickly uh, if, uh, if we see an opportunity for it. 
Right. So that was the chapter of uh, making things impossible, making illegal states impossible, and making errors impossible. Uh, and now we come to the more um, um, supple uh, domain of coupling without cohesion, which is frankly where most bugs uh, go to hide. Of course, <clears throat> in our projects, there are a lot of bugs because in one part of the system, we're changing something and it's breaking something in the complete different part. Uh, for now, I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on low-level code constructs, um, but we'll, at the end, we'll get to how these thing, these ideas apply uh, further. Um, so let's look at coupling without cohesion. And you know, in order to demonstrate that, because these terms can be uh, looked up, I'm going to do a demo um, of some refactoring. Um, so I'm going to do this on a quite known piece of code. It's it's a simulator of the Trivial Pursuit game. Uh, let's explain very quickly that we're moving our thing around the board. When we get onto the yellow uh, spot, then we're asked a science question. When we get into the blue spot, then we're asked a um, question about rock um, and so on. So we they have these categories of questions. Um, and when we answer correctly, we win a piece of uh, piece of cake. So let's uh, let's have a look at the code. All right, so I think you'll see my screen now. Uh, if you don't see it well, please tell me so. Um, first thing I'm just gonna show you is, um, show you one way of, I treat um, code reviews, if if we like code reviews. Uh, some people do code reviews, uh, even if we don't do, or well, let's not get into that, but if we're reviewing code, uh, as code reviews, or if we're just looking at code that was recently produced as a team together. The way I'm doing it is I, I scroll sort of less through the code and I, um, I'm i looking for places that I don't like. If there are pieces of code that I don't like, then it's, it's, it's not unlikely that uh, they are bug prone. And in fact, um, I do that and I stay on, I, I, I inspect the places that I don't like to see if they are actually a future bug generator. So let's do this first on this piece of code. We don't have to understand the code. We just have to look at the shape of it. I don't know. You probably see a few things that you don't like already. And quite a lot of people are gonna like stop here. This is probably the most ugly piece of this code uh, that can exist. It's like a horrendous use of if statements. And, um, <clears throat> and I really don't like that. Probably you don't do either. But is there a problem? Is there, uh, is there coupling without cohesion? Is it likely that a developer that introduces a new feature here is gonna introduce a bug? So I don't know how it's gonna work asking you a question here, but can you think of a feature here um, that could be hard to, um, hard to implement in the code that it is done right now? I don't know if you can put that as a, your answer as a question or something like that. I don't know if you have, if you don't have the possibility to do it interactively, at least think, you know, uh, it's not about 
telling the developer that this shouldn't be done that way, or I don't like that code. Now, it's much more powerful if we can say that, yeah, you know, uh, this might be problematic when we are going to do that. Uh, do you have a better alternative? Do you have a better way of, uh, of doing that? Or are there other ways of doing it that are less likely to be bug prone? So one of the things that um, that I think is going to be hard to do is if we add another category, like, uh, I don't know, history, is it going to be easy? Probably not. It's going to be quite hard to put it on the right spots of the board. And uh, I don't know if you've seen that, but um, they have to be evenly distributed also uh, on the board. And there has to be a, a, as many rock questions as sports questions, as pop questions, and so on and so forth. So that's not so easy to do, right? Uh, in addition, let's look at this one, rock here. How can we be sure that there are as many rock questions as the other questions? So actually, I know that we do have that because we actually have 12 places on the board and these are nine here, so it's possible, but it, it really it really is not helping. Right? Another thing that if we introduce another category, then we'd have to have a look at this piece of code too, right? Because we'd have to add some more here, right? And uh, and some more here and, and so on and, and, and so forth. Yeah, so th there's definitely a lot of coupling here. There's coupling about between these ones, the values here, uh, the size of the board, uh, the collections of questions, the um, and the initialization of these. So can we introduce more cohesion uh, so that it'll work better? Um, let's do that. Let's do that. So one way of, of, of doing it is, uh, my default way is uh, just start by removing duplication to see where that brings us, right? Uh, first thing we can remove here is uh, places current player. I think that that's, let's, let's make a vari variable out of that and replace all those. Uh, let's call that place, why not? Okay. Now we have that. Um, then what we have, we have all these groups here, right? you know, sports, these blocks of questions. Uh, this is a bit duplicated too, and we could actually, it, it's like on position zero, then position four, then eight. So we could do this in a more concise way. We could do this modular four, right? And then this becomes useless, right? Oh, let's, by the way, let's, let's run the tests. Uh, I'm running the test. You can see, I'm, I'm not going to show the test here. We just, we see that they pass here. Uh, uh, I assure you that they, they can fail. Um, uh, in fact, it's, uh, it can be quite interesting to see that we have a, I have only this piece of code, uh, but it actually completely tests the whole application. Not as particularly, uh, uh, nice test, but it's a very nice test to just be able to refactor. Okay. So let's do the fun part, refactoring, because someone wrote the test for us. Um, now, what can we do about this one? Place equals one, five. So that's every fourth also, right? It's the same thing. It's It's right behind the pop question. So we can do this and remove these two and run the test to see if it works. Yeah, it works. So let's, let's do that here too. Modular four, and then we move that. Okay, so it works. Uh, now it's a lot better. Did it become easier now to introduce that new feature? Uh, yes, it did. We did. Uh, there's a lot of letters, places to 
to do this and and uh, we imme almost immediately see that um, if we add another category and put that on the place three, uh, then there are actually not going to be any more rec rock questions, right? So this is definitely not perfect. Um, uh, let's um, uh, also let's solve this problem, which the rock question is treated uh, differently. Um, let's let's treat the rock question as everyone else, you know. Hmm. We can see a kind of pattern here coming 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 back. Um, let's um, let's uh, solve some of the duplication here again. Uh, so I'm going to extract a variable with the place modular four, replace all. And to be frank, I don't have a good name for this yet, uh, but I'm quite sure that it's meaningful. So let's name this to something that will uh, will not forget to name, rename. Hmm. Now we see that we have this kind of um, pattern where we have if statements, and we're mapping from one value to another one. We're mapping from the value of blah blah to the a category, a category name. Uh, there are other ways to do this. Of course, we could use a map. For every case where we're mapping from a value to another value, we can use a map. So all if statements and all switch statements can be, be replaced by that. Uh, and in fact, in this particular case, we can uh, we can map, we can use a array actually, because the keys of the map are uh, zero based and are um, sweet. So right, let's try that. Let's create a list of science, sports, and rock. Uh, so these are the category names. And when we have that list, we can just return the category names get um, blah, blah. And the test passes. So we're good to go. Um, now that we did that, uh, it becomes more uh, easier to name blah, blah. It's see the index of the category, right? So we can name that category index. That's a bit better. Now, did it become easier to introduce a new category? Yes, yes it did. I just have to add one to the list here. And perhaps as you've seen, uh, probably have to change this one too, right? But if I have to change that one too, uh, that means that this four is coupled to the length of this array. So let's introduce some cohesion. Right. Remove that piece of coupling. Okay. So now, this might not be the uh, most explicit piece of code. Um, however, uh, it is uh, hard to break. Hard to break. Let's see if we can uh, do something better uh, later. And, uh, and um, we can see if more globally, is it easy to, easy to introduce a new category? One thing we have to do is we have to um, change here as well. Uh, we'll have to add another if statement, 
And again, this is a duplicated piece of code. Um, so let's reduce duplication first and see what happens. Uh, we were doing the same thing all over the place here, uh, this system about printl on. Um, let's use the if statement to find the list of questions and then uh, do the printing of it at the last, uh, just before returning. So what I'd like to do is I'd have like to have uh, questions. Uh, no, maybe I can't do that. Um, this questions, and then I assign it here. And then let's do that. And then we do questions, remove first. Yes, of course. Um, let's do that. Nice. There's less duplication um, and it hurts less to introduce another if statement here. Um, now, of course, we could replace this with a switch statement, but there's better to do. Um, this is a switch statement or an if statement where we're mapping from a value to another value. So we can use a map for that. Um, and there are a lot of advantages of doing that uh, that I don't have some time to go into, but maybe after the presentation. Um, so let's initialize a map where the key is pop and the value is pop questions. And the other key is science, where the value is science questions, sports mapping to sports questions, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is a bit long to type. Uh, so I have this incredible shortcut of IntelliJ uh, that does it for me. <laughs> So let's assign that to a variable. Um, what can we call that? Uh, maybe a questions deck. Or maybe, maybe let's let's call that a questions map, actually. Now. And then we can simply uh, do questions equals questions map. Get uh, the current category. Then we can probably remove these things and run the tests and see if it works. Yes, it does. Now let's clean this up a little bit. Uh, that's great. We don't need this one anymore. Um, so I'll do that. Move it closer to usage. That's a lot better. Um, maybe we don't even need this variable, actually. I don't know. Let's inline that to see. That's maybe a bit too much, right, on one line. But let's let's keep this one. The bar here. Okay. Now, did it become easier to introduce um, a new category? Yeah. Yeah, anyway, I just have to add a thing here and uh, and then here but still those methods are um, linked to each other um, so maybe we could do something about that because basically these this list is just the keys of um, of this map and the the size here is just that part um, Yeah, I guess we could do something. Um, only problem is I kind of have an order here of them. So I'd have to use a, uh, I'd have to use a sorted map actually. And um, yeah, I'm not up for that. 
so I have this piece of coupling here, and I don't have a good way of solving that, at least in the language Java. Um, in JavaScript, I would have some other languages maybe, but um, we're playing with Java here. So um, let's look at the rest. Uh, so we have this, and then in the constructor, we have this, we have all this. And there's actually this whole piece of thing that are actually concerned with only the questions. And this class does a lot of other things. So maybe we maybe what we could do is that we do have some coupling. Maybe we can put all that into another class and then we'll have a lot of cohesion around that class and then we could test things only in that class. Uh, even if it's not reusable, it would reduce problems. Um, my idea is to do something like this. So what we do have right now is we have a questions map. We have a game class. It has questions map. It has a public method role that we haven't seen. And it's using private methods as question and current category, which we're dealing with. Uh, now, alternative design for this um, would be to extract the questions deck class and uh, basically wrap the map of questions in its own class. So this would be encapsulating the primitive, the map of questions. And then we'd have a public method, ask question, private method, current category, which it uses, uh, and so on and so forth. So let's, um, let's do that now. Um, so for this, we'll have to ask a question. We'll, new, we'll need a new uh, class. Right. New deck class, let's create that one. Yes, please. Uh, now, um, in order to move, now this is tricky. Uh, we could just go with the, uh, destroy all the code and, and, uh, and uh, make it not compile, and then after maybe a few minutes, uh, everything would work. But I like to take small steps. They are less risky, and I can use more of the automated refactorings. Uh, now, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not that uh, evident. There's one way of doing this, is to introduce a delegate. Uh, but it it doesn't do exactly what I want. Uh, so I'm gonna take, take us through another way of doing it in a stepwise uh, way. Um, so let's make this, um, in order to move this method to the new class, I have to have uh, a deck and I have to put that as a field of the current class which I will initialize in the constructor. And when I do that, I can actually move this one to the, to the, to the deck class. Another thing that I have to do is to uh, make sure that this class does not call private properties. Uh, so I'll do that by um, actually having these properties in the deck class. I'm gonna copy this piece of code here. I'm not breaking anything. The, the tests are still running a bit here. And um, let's create a constructor. I will not initialize anything. I will paste the piece of code I copied from the other class. And we're almost ready to go. So now, if I use the uh, deck properties instead. And this method does not adhere to, um, to uh, the game class questions. And it doesn't adhere to uh, the game class anymore. 
Just one last thing I have to do before I can actually just move the methods. Uh, there is this thing here that I cannot do inside this method. So I'll have to pass it as a parameter. Let's do that. Oh uh, no, let's not do it like that. Let's do it like that instead. Yep, that's are still running. Okay, and then I'll move this one one step further up also because I want to move the ask question method to the deck class. Let's select all that. Let's select all occurrences of it. And there we go. Yes, so still running. And now I can probably move this uh, to the. Um, oh, let's start by moving this one. to the deck class. Okay, on the tests. Good. Now let's move this one to the deck class. Great. So now there's almost nothing left here about these questions we have to we can remove this piece of code here and we can remove this piece of code here awesome awesome so what do we have here um we have something that is not ideal because in order to introduce a new category uh we'll have to change these thing kind of things. Uh, we could put this as a constant of the class or a field. Of course, this one too, and so on and so forth. But all is contained with inside this piece of class. And since we've separated that, we can test it. And we have, all in all, found places where we had um, coupling, where it was probable that uh, introducing a new category would introduce a bug because there was no cohesion between the different places that were coupled. We've improved the cohesion and we've removed some of the coupling. Uh, and so that because of that, we have less space for errors. Very well. That's all for that demo. I hope you understood something, even though the um, the, uh, the, the you don't know the, about the code, the rest of the code. Yeah, uh, very impressive refactoring, Johan. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the live demo. This was the ugly trivia kata. I yes, think. yes, it is. Yes. Well, actually, it's not quite. Uh, it's actually the bug zero kata. I took the trivia code. Ah, okay. I adapted yeah. it a little bit to to explore more. Um, more um, bug generators. Ah, okay, and so yeah. Is, yeah, it's it's very similar to that, and I completely stole all of that. And it's a bug zero card, of which of which I have a link at the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, regarding the twenty one tricks um, you have in the subtitle of the announcement, where are we now? Uh, we are uh, at. Uh, um, Around the the middle, uh, we have um, it, the other ones will be shown in less detail. So I'm trying to change screen. It doesn't want me to do that. Okay, and uh, Alex, welcome. Also, nice that you're here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so okay, Jon, and so I'll shut up and uh, let you continue. <laughs> There are no questions so far. I don't actually. I don't see the. I don't see the the sharing screen while I'm. Um... No, there's a no question for the moment. Great. Yeah. Well, well, it'll be great to have questions also, of course. Uh, it's, um, don't hesitate. So, <clears throat> um, now let's go on. 
uh, what we do have is uh, next thing we have is um, a bug generator, uh, which I call hidden testable code. Sometimes we have uh, hard to test code, but we're hiding easy to test code with inside. So we have called to some dependency and that's hard to mock and complicated stuff. Uh, I mean, mocked tests are less desirable than, than other tests. And then we have a lot of pure logic in between. And then we have to call to another dependency with the transformed data. Um, so this is, this is, this is too bad really, because it's too easy to fix. Um, this is real piece of code, just to make it like that we're calling an external server on the first uh, line up here. Then we're calling the database on the second line. And then we have a whole range of pure logic. Uh, and, and this is real life code. I had a uh, four times that much code uh, before we eventually uh, called to the database again. And there was, of course, a range of bugs that appeared in this code over a few weeks. It's too bad because just extract method and we could test all that pure logic because all the bugs were in the pure transformation logic, of course. So solve easily by extracting a method, the second method, uh, which just takes values as input and returns values as outputs. Very easy to test. To write 10 tests for this would take not long at all. And uh, it just makes more sense to test and refactor it because it's not really well written. Now, what else do we have as like bug generating code uh, or or uh, what kind of patterns do we have to have less bug generators? If we have edgeless code, uh, which reduces cognitive load and reduces the number of possibilities, uh, there are common things like if we replace an if by an option, uh, an if by a list or map, as we've seen, uh, there's, there's more structure in the code. And the actual data structures can actually be used in the code and it's more natural it kind of pushes and pushes us in the right direction um, we have the idea of a null object i'm going to go into that but uh, we have we can use polymorphism so that we have more structure around what is allowed in our code or what is currently the domain of our code uh, we can use lambdas instead of iterating in indexed for loops there are less errors uh, possible. And we don't have to re-implement things that are already there. We can eliminate exceptions from the middle part of our stack if we're doing backend development and just catching them at the top. There's so much code uh, in some projects that can just disappear if we only throw at the bottom and catch at the very top. If we have small methods, then they are much more focused. There are much more less variables. It's much clearer what variables are uh, at stake. And um, it's much easier to, to, to be aware if we're doing any reordering mistakes. Um, if we do immutability, if we uh, don't mutate our objects, then we don't have a time vector. I, we use that for the temporal coupling. Uh, also, there are no implicit messages. Uh, there's not one part of the code that can change under the hood the value for another part of the code. So that whenever we have to do that kind of thing, we have to do something explicit. Uh, and if we do that, there are less places for bugs to come in. And then we have the nulls. So I'm sorry, th this this is not translated from French uh, because it doesn't um, doesn't translate that well. Um, anyway, so it's crap uh, basically, but it's the same word for crap and 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 null. Um, and the inventor of null, uh, Tony Hoare, he recognized that it was a complete mistake, and he was sorry that he he. Uh, 
caused that upon the software development industry. Um, it's it's so good with null that JavaScript even invented a second null. So in JavaScript we have undefined and null, and they are not the same. <laughs> it's such a useful concept, the null, right? But we can reduce the use of null, and we should if we want to re uh, reduce the errors. Uh, in some languages we have non-nullable types like TypeScript, Kotlin, PHP. Uh, some languages we have annotations. And even when we don't have that, we can have um, like a, a rule in the team of trying not to ever return null. We can return optional, we can return a null object. And, um, and basically we can also validate at the entry point of the application all invalid cases. Uh, we can replace null with empty string. We can replace empty uh, uh, a null array with an empty array. Uh, there are just less cases to handle. All we have to do is protect the entry points and then with inside uh, we have good validation. So I like to look at real projects. And uh, this the following example is from a real project where there was, um, over the course of a few weeks, there were, um, I think, three or four bugs uh, in the same piece of code. And um, I uh, kind of wanted to know that what happened, you know, what are the, there's probably a bug generator in there. You know? uh, and I looked at the Git log and uh, you can see this like, fix the deletion, correct the deletion, and then fix the delete again with three dots. <laughs> so it basically seems like the same problem has been solved several times. And then I took a look at the code. It's a bit complex, but just look at what jumps to the eye. <laughs> you can see the log statements, right? You can see that the developer who was doing the, the he couldn't bear it anymore. He was so sick and tired that the actual fix that was there for, that had been there for a few weeks now, it, it contained these log statements. Uh, he was just probably so fed up with it. Uh, and this is almost a non-modified piece of code. So four bugs in the, over a few weeks in this piece of code. And I looked at it for a long time trying to understand what was the problem here. Uh, it was, it could took me quite some time, but then I realized what this piece of code was actually was doing. It was doing a cascade delete on the, uh, in, a, in a MongoDB document. So I was having a property here. If I delete it here, I have to delete it in another, a few other places uh, in that same object. And so how do we fix that? Um, well, we could introduce an abstraction of cascade delete, like saying that, okay, this property is uh, exists here and here and here. And then we can have um, generic code to actually delete that so that we, we solve the problem only once. Well, now there are some questions. So uh, <laughs> um, we have we have some questions now. Uh, maybe you can first uh, go back a couple of slides to the one where you extracted the pure logic. Yeah. So um, the first question is, uh, okay, I use a lambda, and should I test that line of code with the lambda? Is that the question? So or, Michael, yeah, depending on uh, how big he, it is, he uh, he promotes the usage of lambdas. Yeah, but now he he saw okay, then I create untestable code. Uh, I'm not so sure why. I, yeah. uh, maybe because it's a uh, lambda is is an anonymous function, so it's not yeah. testable. It's not reachable from a test. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. It's just like in, in your example, just some nested code, nested, nested. Mm. And if there's a, a bug, you can't test that uh, in isolation. Well, so 
his question is when is your what is your recommendation when to attract extract the lambda to a method always yeah so because if we use lambdas because if we extract the lambda to a method then we it becomes public and we can test it or sort of um well um the problem if the tests are too uh, low then if we change the way that we write the code not the not the observable behavior from the outside but we change how we do it for i don't know performance reason or whatever uh, or for readability uh, then there is a high risk of throwing away that test uh, so i try to find places in the code uh, where the test can be uh, expressed in a very functional way uh, because that will not change so much so i will try to probably test a bit higher up uh, because the higher up i test the more refactorability i get of course if it's too high up it can be uh, a very long test and so on uh, but yeah try to find a functional place and and recognize that whenever I tr decide to test someplace, it's a design decision which is going to be hard to undo because I have to rewrite the tests as well. So the second question from the same person, optional has not been a good replacement in our teams. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's just uh, called optional get. Carelessly. Yeah. <laughs> you probably have seen that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I I don't really promote things to teams uh, anymore. I I share knowledge. I I do coding dojos with the teams so that they will uh, train and, and and learn and, and gain new uh, knowledge. And then I kind of trust them to use whatever is they found reasonable. But the real problem is that we're trying to promote promote often because there's a mismatch between what people know and what could be useful for the project. So I try to solve the problem that they don't know this. And then most people, when they know the different options, uh, choose the right one, or at least know better when to change. It's like uh, start yeah. with the why. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Instead, uh, instead uh, show solutions, start with the problems and then go to possible solutions. Yeah. So I'll, um, there's another question, but I'll, I'll wait a bit for that one because I don't think it's uh, necessary right now. Um, okay, so what are some other bug sources? Um, well, hard to understand code, simply. Hard to understand code, as we've seen uh, up there, is likely to introduce bugs much more likely than code that is easy to understand. Um, so yeah, it's it's simple, but it has to be said, right? Um, then we have this other family is where we compensate for errors. So compensate for errors. Um, this is extracted from a real merge request. It was a fix of a configuration file where the fix was replacing or putting a slash in front of uh, the public path here. This was because we had concatenated a URL with this path. And of course, the URL was sometime, sometimes without the slash. So I don't know, we're calling google.com socket server and it blows up, of course. Uh, so this was a fix, but to me, that's not fixing the root cause. The root cause is that we're concatenating with the plus and we're doing that possibly in a lot of places, whereas we should do something which is less bug prone. So solve the real problem, the design, not the configuration. And then we can put whatever we want in the configuration. Configuration. In here, in this case, for instance, host name with the socket with the public path, right? We join those. The this is a method that has been tested, we can trust it, uh, and even worse, like, but this doesn't solve the problem. It solves the problem locally. It solves the problem on the line that I had this error, but it doesn't solve it for the rest of the project. 
if I wanted to do that, I do kind of the same thing as I did with the tic-tac-toe uh, and the deck and so on. I can encapsulate uh, the socket host in a object and I can expose a, part, a method on it, a pen path, that will take care of adding a, an extra slash if need be. And as we saw before, it's quite tempting to put some tests, uh, even if you don't like TDD, like me, uh, on the uh, socket host class, because that test has value, because it ensures the behavior in the whole project. Right. Now, if all else fails, <laughs> let's document. <laughs> And we need to document when the design is not intuitive. I see documenting as a failure to express myself in the code. And I, I do document it, I do document. Then of course I document public APIs and stuff like that, but most of the code that I'm writing is not public IP APIs. And I don't document that unless I fail expressing myself in the code. Because we see that, um, it is useful, it is useful sometimes, but it's useful often because we failed making things intuitive. So this is a photo from a place where I went to uh, give this uh, conference. And I was, I was trying to um, uh, get some, um, uh, get the water to, uh, to, to come up. and I couldn't get it water to come here and didn't come when I put my hands under. So I eventually put my hand to the left and, and then I got soap on my hands. <laughs> so I was in even deeper shit until I saw the piece of documentation to the right, please touch here, and then water came. Yeah, and then what I find really nice is here, we, we can see that the documentation they, they put here, it has some maintenance cost. It'll have to be replaced just as our code has code comments have to be maintained. So I do it when I can't express myself in the code sufficiently. All right, so I, I did promise that uh, I would uh, end with um, like putting this in a larger perspective. So a lot of the examples have been very low level, uh, very useful, uh, but the idea of coupling and cohesion uh, couldn't even be applied to microservices. So this is an example where, um, from a real project again, where we had um, a few teams and we had, um, we kind of had not such a, well, we, we had a lot of common things uh, with the uh, DNS and proxies. Um, there's uh, all the, the tests that do, did some, um, smoke testing uh, on the public APIs, they had to know all the URLs that were deployed. Uh, we had uh, monitoring that had to monitor all the servers that were deployed. We had some Terraform script that had to be maintained at the same time as the Ansible, um, Ansible config maps, the Kubernetes, uh, no, the Kubernetes config maps, and so on and so forth. Uh, we also had application config that was kind of coupled to this uh, because we had uh, server names and so on. Basically, a lot of the uh, DevOps code that we have on these probably suffers from these things that if you change them, something in one place, you have to change it in a few other places. Um, an easy way that we solved this in this project um, was that we, um, we actually did centralize in a database um, all the intrinsic data. And then we coded the function that from this intrinsic data, the, this server is deployed and so on. Uh, we we uh, projected the configuration files, the proxy, the DNS configurations, the Kubernetes config maps and so on. Uh, we had a function for each file to generate. And actually the, the, the database that we used was a TypeScript file because that means that we would get uh, type hints uh, when we were, uh, we could see what, what properties were there and so on and so forth. The compilation could help a lot. Um, so a TypeScript file, a lot of TypeScript functions, 
uh, generating text files uh, that we uh, just applied with Kubernetes, Ansible, and so on. So now we have something where we have a lot of uh, cohesion between what is in the TypeScript uh, file and what gets deployed. Um, so that's great. So we have a lot of cohesion where we're coupling, but it's not very easy for a developer uh, to modify something in TypeScript database and make sure that the deployment will uh, happen correctly. So we just added a little thing on top of that, uh, which was a tool which, okay, I modify one thing here. Uh, I modified a very central piece of thing here. And it told me how many things uh, were changed. So 153 files were changed due to that uh, uh, little change. And I can inspect, so we, it's very small, I don't know if you see, but you kind of see a directory structure of all the files that uh, we generated. And you can see the files that are different. So you can click on them and you can see the diff. So this gets a very, very uh, inspectable way of seeing how the configuration, uh, what the actual configurations file that would be deployed uh, did look like. And then every time we deployed, we commit to a repository so that we have each time we knew exactly what was uh, in production. So this was a way of introducing cohesion where there was a lot of coupling and where there was a lot of uh, duplication and this actually enabled us uh, to experiment a lot with different uh, tools because we did not have to uh, maintain duplication in uh, Ansible, Kubernetes, uh, Terraform places because there was no duplication anymore. Or it was machine generated duplication. Yeah, so uh, it was a very, very small project. It looks big like this, but we used a few tools and uh, this is basically the the code uh, in the output data logic, you just, uh, these are uh, functions, pure functions, very, very easy to do. All right, so let's wrap up. When we want to reduce the number of bugs, we have to look at the sources of them. Uh, they come a lot of some kind of false assumption. One very common thing is we have a regression. Uh, why? Because we have some implicit constraints. A menu cannot be composed of just a starter. Uh, we have um, we have a temporal coupling. There are only three places on the board. Um, we have coupling without cohesion, as we saw with the demo. And we have a non-testable code, and we have non-understandable code. Um, non-testable and, and non-understandable code are kind of two facets of a similar thing. They are inspectable. Uh, the, the testable code is inspected by tests. So the knowledge is encoded in the tests and the tests are continually inspecting it for us. It helps to our brain. And actually non-understandable code or hard to understand code is something that is not inspectable by human brain or hard to inspect and that's a bug generator, clearly. So these are regressions, but there are also other uh, sources of bugs that I haven't treated here. Uh, there are unclear specs. Uh, so if we don't do specification by example or example mapping or you know enumerate the examples uh, that we'll use for testing, then we're sure to misunderstand um, the specs in some subtle way. Uh, we also have the fault implementation, like I put a piece of code, I, I, I develop a piece of code, but it doesn't do what I think it does. So simple TDD solves that uh, because it, it kind of uncovers those false assumptions, but I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to talk about tests. So I'm not going to talk about that here. Yeah. And I think that with that, we have a lot, a lot of the sources of bugs uh, covered. Last thing, I, I suggest that for the next bug, within your team, you ask yourself why and what can we change? 
I also suggest that uh, if you do code reviews, um, they can be conflictual. One way of thinking of it is that if you can do this thing, scan the code, see places we don't like, think about a feature that would be hard to implement. Is it likely to come into our project? If not, the code is more or less okay. Uh, we will have to find another reason. But if it is bug prone, then you have a really nice reason uh, to put in your code review. Beware of the primitive obsession. It, uh, it, it doesn't allow us to encode the business constraints. Uh, and uh, you can train yourself. The, so the, the, the demo I did was on the bug zero card. And there are a lot of other things you can do. And there's the link here um, with, the, with the bug zero card. And P.T. Cock asks, what is the link for the presentation by Ola Belshi? Um, I don't have it <laughs> in Google. Uh, I can Google afterwards. Uh, it, you'll see a few videos on, on YouTube by him. And I'll post you the link of the slides also, of course, because they are, I'll update them slightly, but they are online. Um, right, so should I? Put that in the chat, maybe. Yes, please. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much. And then there's one question regarding a, a book. Oh yes, yes. Are there any books that are good for uh, teaching about this topic? Um, uh, there are two things I'd like to mention. Um, um, I don't have the links here. Um, there's um, Alexandro Balbaca, uh, which is a crafter. Um, I'll send you the, the exact uh, spelling of it, um, who um, wrote about a, a subject called a usable uh, software design. He's published a book about that, and it's the idea of taking a usability and in the usability, you have this kind of error proneness. Um, how, how likely is it to make an error and how costly is it? Uh, so part of the book touches on that subject. Um, my, I got most inspiration from actual usability books. Uh, that's the that's, uh, best inspiration I got. Um, like, you know, how, how do you design systems that they don't have errors. Like ATM machines, you cannot leave without getting your card, right? Because you have to wait, take your card in order to get the money. Stuff like that. The books of Alex of Alex Bulbaka is, yeah. is the one on LeanPub, the usable software design. Yes. Okay, I found it. I'll share the link in the chat. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, Michael Kepler. Are there any um, um, good tools uh, that will? Well, they, there's. I mean, Sonar. I guess most of us have used Sonar at some point. Um, for instance, we didn't integrate uh, PMD, and uh, I don't know. I can't remember the other name of it. Uh, that actually do these static code analysis analysis on it. Um, I, I tend to look at the code and it doesn't take me a lot of time at all. I kind of, I work on several projects, but I kind of scan almost all code that has been written. I just scan it and there are, I mean, most patterns are strikes the eye, you know, yeah, they are indented or they have a lot of if statements or I don't know. Uh, and then I, I also look at when there are several bugs in the same piece of code coming in a project. That's interesting. The, the, we can always learn from our past mistakes. And if we've had two bugs in a piece of code, it's likely if we, have, we haven't refactored it, that we'll get another one. And all these things will make people aware of them. Yeah. There's also another tool which I really like, which is Code Scene. Uh, it's in, it's 
you know, Code as a Crime Scene uh, book um, that also exposes high risk areas or high risk branches. Uh, that's that's a very good thing also to look at. It's an amazing tool, which basically look at how we work with the code to deduce which parts of the code are costing us the most and are just filtering out the code that is the most changed and the most complex. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. I think uh, we'll close the official part here and then move on to our wonder.me room. Great. Yeah, let's do that. So, so thank you everyone for coming and uh, for those who are coming, see you right now. And for everyone else, uh, have a nice evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>